Good morning, and welcome back, everyone, to congregational worship. After missing a week from the storm, it is good to be back worshiping together. The caring and support of congregational fellowship is a value beyond measure. Today, we move directly into the second Sunday of Advent. During this Advent season, we will be reflecting on God's righteousness. The passage I will read from Jeremiah evokes a righteous branch springing up from a dead or damaged tree. The uh, display here also models that. As Jeremiah was quoting these words from God, the line of King David's dynasty was coming to an end. Pondering God's righteousness is a little unsettling to me. It brings to mind the Old Testament association of God's righteousness with doom and destruction and judgment. It's a little scary. Yet, even in the Old Testament, God's righteousness is layered with redemption, with hope and restoration. God's righteousness is God setting things right. It has been a difficult week for our family and for many of you who know and, and love Billy. There has been other loss. Pastor Bob lost a barn. Some of Renee's friends have been uprooted from their homes in Anchorage. Others in the congregation are dealing with their own loss and pain. We are, fragile, we are fragile beings in a broken world. The evening news hour is a difficult watch. In Advent, we hear the promise of God to come and set things right. In Advent, we are waiting and watching for God in Jesus to show up with righteousness and set things right in us and in the world. Advent is a time of expectant waiting. For the, for the next minute or so, I invite us to wait on God in silence. We can put our concerns and distractions aside for a bit and simply wait on God quietly. Following that, I will read the, the Jeremiah passage. Let's relax, calm our thoughts, and wait on God who sets things right. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Let's stand as you are able for a hymn of invocation. Lo, how a rose air blooming, uh, number 211 in the blue hymnal.
You may be seated, obviously. And anyone who is young, a, a, ch a child, who'd like to come forward for the children's story, I'm actually going to meet you at the back door. So I'm going to go to the back door, and any children who want to come up for the children's candle lighting time can meet me at that back door. No, you don't have to be quiet. It's fine. You can come. You know, join. It's children's time. We can shout for joy. Even Kaysen. Okay, you're going to wait with me here at the back? All right, we're going to go up. And if, if you want to bring a parent with you, you can. But they have to agree to do what we're doing. Parents, can you agree to do what the kids are doing? No. <laughs> go sit back down. <laughs> no. uh, that's fine. Sometimes we have divergence in our family, and we have to work it out. What I want to do before we go up and light some candles, how many of you like fire and candles? Ooh. Yeah, when he says, ooh, really excitedly. I'm also excited for the candles. But in order to get up there, I want to have us go a particular way. Do you think we should skip? No. No. Do you think we should crawl? No. Do you think we should run? Yes. 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 I kind of like that idea. But we're not going to run either. How many of you know, I'm going to come over here. You guys wait. If I say red light, green light, and yellow light, do you know what that is? Let, let's see if you know what that is. Red light. Green light. Yellow light. Yellow light. Yellow light. Green light. Red light. Red light. Red light. Green light. Yellow light. Red light. Look how much farther we, ahead, we are ahead than they are. It's not a race. Yellow light. You guys want to catch up to us in the yellow? Green light. Let's let them catch up to us. Green light. Okay, now red light. Now, we're going to walk around the corner. We're going to go toward the candles. Anybody find where the candles are in this big building? Yeah? Okay, so I want the littlest ones. We're going to walk around the table very carefully, not to knock it. Don't touch it if you can help yourselves. And I want the littlest ones to sit on the steps and the big ones to sit around the steps, okay? Is that agreed? So now we're green light. We're going to go sit by the steps. Okay, I want the littlest ones, if they want to, to sit here on the steps and the others, bigger ones. Joanna, you can sit here beside me. There we go, Red. Okay. Okay, did we get up here very, very quickly or did it take us a while? It took us a little bit, okay, a little bit of time. Not, not forever, not super long, but it took a little bit of time. So I want to ask you another question about we, uh, taking a long time or a little bit of time. What season are we in right now? Winter. winter. Oh, yeah, and winter's a very long season. Any other seasons we're in that are like not, not winter, spring, fall, or summer? What, what time of year? What, what holiday season? Christmas. Joanna. Christmas, Christmas season, yeah. We're, and actually, and I don't want to get nitpicky, but I'll, I'll get nitpicky with the adults. We're not actually in Christmas season. We're in Advent season, but we often conflate the two. We are in a season of Advent and Christmas, and uh, is it Christmas yet? Christmas Day yet? No. no. Uh, how long from now is Christmas Day? Is it like a really, really forever long time? A medium time or like really soon? You think it's really soon? Okay, good. Anybody feel like Christmas is still kind of a ways away? It's a while yet. Eli thinks it's a while. It is. It feels like a while, doesn't it? Well, when we get into the Advent season, the word Advent is kind of a funny word. It just means when people show up. If, if I come into this building this morning, that was, when you came in, that was your Advent. You, you showed up. Um, and so we're waiting in Advent and Christmas season for who to show up? Anybody know? Uh, who are we waiting to show up? Anybody? What, what person in our Bible stories? What person in our faith? Yeah, Rhett. Uh, God. God. Yeah, we're waiting for God to show up, and specifically God with Jesus. Uh, that's pretty exciting. So we're waiting in the Christmas season. You know the Christmas stories where Jesus is, like, how big is he in the Christmas stories? Like a big adult or a small kid or a tiny baby? Do you know your Oh, he's big? In some of the stories, he's big. 
He also shows up in the, the nativity, the Christmas story, as a, as a newborn baby, like some of these guys here. And it takes a long time for us to wait for newborn babies like Jesus to show up. It takes a long time for us to wait for Christmas to come. And it took you a fairly long time to get down the aisle for this children's story this morning, didn't it? We went slower than we could have. Yeah, we had to wait, do some red light, yellow light, before green light. Each Sunday before we get to Christmas, we light a candle behind us. Okay? Part of it is uh, they remind us that in a dark world in the wintertime when it's cold, God lights a bright light and warmth to keep us warm and uh, to keep the, the scary darkness away. But they're also a reminder that when we walk in, that we're still waiting, that Jesus is coming, that light is there. We're waiting, the light's on, but not all the candles are lit yet. So we light the can a new candle each week. This is actually the second week, so we're going to light two candles. The candles simply remind us that we are still waiting, even though it takes a long time. Okay? So I want two of you to help the congregation have their candles. Who can help me light? Uh, Prabha, you want to help? You want to help? Okay. I'm, I'm going to hold. You guys, you guys can maybe help next, next week. Arette, do you want to move down a step? Caden, I'm going to have you go first. And you're going to do this one. So if you want to just step here by Joanna. And do you know how to work this, or should I help you? Okay. Go ahead and light this first candle. Okay, this is... Okay, is it lit? Okay, this candle reminds us that even when the, it's dark and cold, God shines a bright light to keep us from being scared and keep us warm and happy. I want you to, probably, you're going to light the next one? I'm going to help you, okay? You, you guide my hand, okay? I'm going to light it, and you guide it. Ready? Point it where to go. Okay, is it lit? Is it lit? How many, can, we got two candles. How many, how many candles are there yet before we get to Christmas? There's three more, yeah. We've still got some waiting. We're kind of in the yellow light season of walking to Christmas. Kind of slow. We've got a lot of candles to go yet. But Jesus is there. It's just, Jesus is coming, and it's going to be hard to wait, but we're going to wait together. Okay, that way we don't all get impatient and run ahead with green light. Okay? You guys can go back to your seat after I have a prayer. Um, I just want us to, to know these candles help us keep on waiting. Uh, let's, let's pray to Jesus, okay? Dear God, thank you for promising to come and be with us this morning. Thank you for coming as Jesus, uh, as a young boy, um, in the Christmas story. We are eager for you to show up here and give us life and take away our fears. But we also uh, need your help because of waiting it takes a long time. And waiting is hard. It's hard to wait. So help us as we light these candles to remember that you are, are coming, no matter how long we have to wait. And we have other people around us helping us. Be strong in our waiting. Be patient. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can walk back to your seats at normal speed, and we'll come back up next week for some more waiting. Thank you, Eli. As adults, we might not be struggling to wait for the same thing the kids are waiting for. We might be anticipating uh, the arrival of family, or we might be anticipating the end of winter <laughs> or the melting of the snow. Or, as a congregation, we're anticipating a healing to the hurts we feel with the situation with Billy or with others in our own family. Some of you are facing health concerns. So we come into this time in our worship waiting for God to set things right. For God's righteousness to come in the form of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. And what better thing to do than while we wait than to pray. To reach out to God with our words and our thoughts together and say, God, we're sitting here waiting for you to set things right. We need your help. We need you to know our needs. So this is your time. I'm going to have the ushers come. There we go, with microphones. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, the Brockmiller family is actually going to give an update, but I'm going to ask that that come toward the end, because uh, I don't want to have that come and be followed by an announcement or something. I want you to feel free, knowing that, that uh, Billy's family and Lee and Marilyn and the others are facing such a, a heavy burden this week, and so are we, I don't want you to feel like you 
your needs are not worthy to be shared here as well. God doesn't categorize our needs by small and large. This is a, a time for sharing any needs or prayer requests or praises or even a few announcements if needed. So please raise your hand, share with us, we'll pray for you, and then we're, when we're done sharing, I'm going to ask Cindy to, to give an update from the family. What other things do you carry into your prayer time? Prayer requests, praises, thanksgivings, announcements. What do you have? These young men will give you a microphone. I see Anna's got one in the back. If you want to take it to her, you can come back then after that. So, this is Anna Waldner. I am also waiting on something. On, I have 21 days left uh, working at Merchant State Bank. I am very excited to go back to school for my second bachelor's and to go to school for nursing. I am terrified. I'm 35 years old going back to school then not going to be working for a couple years, so that's exciting. Um, but you may notice that Colin is not going to be here quite a bit because he is picked up Saturday and Sunday shifts at the post office. Yes, they deliver Amazon packages on Sunday in Sioux Falls. So if you see me and my crazy crew all over the place, jumping up on the ceilings like monkeys or whatever, that's why. Um, so I could really use some prayers to <laughs> make sure my kids are safe while I'm, my, my husband isn't home and I'm going back to school and not going to work. <laughs> so that would be great. Thanks. You're not going to be working in a paying way. You're working in a lot of other ways. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. What else? Uh, I think Jody He has one. At first Bob and then Jody. Uh, this is Pastor Bob. Uh, it takes a long time for a fire truck to get to your farm when there's a fire. Uh, thank you for the concern. Thank Pastor Nick for calling and asking if we were okay. We were both fine. Um, we think it's an electrical fire. I lost a lot of my toys, my skid loader, and a few things like that. But we are fine, and uh, thank you for the concern. We're going to make it through this, and then the scope of things. I know there are people who have much heavier concerns and burdens than we do. But anyhow, thank you for your prayers and thoughts. Good morning, this is Jody. I just want to make a final announcement. For those of you who maybe missed a couple weeks ago, um, we're doing an angel tree this year for a local family in need. Um, thank you to everyone who has already brought so much. Um, the deadline is next Sunday, so if you could bring back all your items, we're going to deliver them that week. So again, thanks for your generosity. This is Dennis, and I just wanted to uh, report and give thanks for a good trip to the Sacred Shawl Shelter in Martin, South Dakota. Our five of us uh, went with the MDS van and trailer to uh, do some uh, finishing up in their facility there and repair work, and uh, we had a, a good time and got it all done in two days. So we feel blessed. Thank you. Who else? Paul? Good morning, everyone. This is Paul Balzer. I just wanted to make sure everybody is aware and invite everyone to first we'll have a potluck following Sunday school today, followed by our annual business meeting this afternoon. So we invite everyone to come for fellowship at the noon meal, and then we'll have some discussion time and some forward-looking time and reflecting time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, moderator, Assistant Moderator Paul. If there aren't other things, uh, I want to give Cindy a chance to give a, a note from the family. Where, where is Cindy? There we are, Cindy Evanson. Cindy Rockwell. Hi. Um, as you probably know, our family is really heartbroken um, at the loss of my nephew Bill, um, but we're also very comforted by all the stories of 
Bill and the evidence of his tremendous faith in God and how much he loved other people. Um, that's just been really heartwarming um, through this whole week. Um, one of the most difficult things is that um, Bill chose to be an organ donor and um, that's a wonderful gift to many people. Um, but the process takes a long time and they have to um, make sure that none of the medications that he was given when he came in are still in his body. Um, and so uh, actually they're hoping to do that today. So all this time his family is there in Boulder away from home waiting for this process to take place. Um, they so much appreciate all the thoughts and prayers that everybody has um, sent forth and given for them. Uh, one of the um, kind of ironic but very um, comforting things has been uh, James and Charmaine Reese live in Boulder uh, or nearby Boulder and um, were actually waiting for them when they got to the hospital Wednesday morning and have been a tremendous um, source of comfort for them in the fact that they lost a young son also. Um, I guess personally um, looking at this whole situation, um, I'm just, uh, I don't have the words to say what kind of a life that Bill led. It was such a purposeful life and he, he loved so much and he did so much in such a, a short amount of time. And um, I look at that as a challenge for my own life. Um, and I also um, have been reminded again of the comfort that um, is in God's love. Um, also a great appreciation um, for our, from our whole family, especially Billy and Joe have mentioned um, numerous times that Pastor Nick has really um, been wonderful in providing um, support and being there for them, even though it's from afar. So thank you, Pastor Nick, and thank you, everybody. And I should say, I think this was one of the posts that they do receive the texts or, or voice messages you, you give, um, but understandably they can't, don't have the energy or the time to respond to them all, but they do receive them and they find them to be an uplifting thing. So thank you also from those expressions from afar. Let's carry this and the other things into prayer. Uh, this is a season of waiting for God to make all things right and all things new. So let's, let's carry these needs to God. God, we begin to understand just a little bit of what the people of Israel were feeling right before Jesus arrived. Great tragedy, great pains, great loss, and they eagerly anticipated that you would come down and be with them. This week, when we heard the news, God, that Billy had been in a very critical skiing accident, we also felt the need the anguish, the call for you to come down and be with this family. Come down and be alongside Bill and to be alongside us. Five, six days later, we are still waiting. Still in need of your presence alongside this family. We ask you in this moment, as they continue to wait, as they've expended much mental energy and spiritual energy in, in saying goodbyes and spending time that you give them the last, last, lasting strength they need to continue through this long process. We ask that you lift up Joe and Betty and Bobby and Michonne and his girlfriend Elizabeth as they accompany Bill through the next medical steps. And when the time comes, if no grand, great miracles are in view, Lord, we ask that you receive Bill into your care, even as he is now resting in your care in the hospital. We commend him into your caregiving hands that, that 
care for him beyond the bounds of this earthly world. And we celebrate in the hope, in the knowledge that Bill's faith was strong, the way he lived as a follower of your son Jesus reminds us that he will be called a faithful servant. Thank you for his witness to us in life and now even as he approaches death. Continue to give us the endurance to support the family, even if it's just with a word here or a silent hug there when they return. Give the family strength as they wait out the last, perhaps, days or at least moments with Bill in person. When it's time for them to travel back, give them alertness and safety on the roads or in the plane. We give you thanks for all the expressions of support, especially the providence of James and Charmaine being present with them when they arrived on Wednesday morning. Lord, rend the heavens and come down. We are waiting for you to fulfill your promises of life. And yet we still live in a world in which accidents and death and tragedy occur. We also carry with us into this worship space a handful of other griefs or challenges. The losses that Bill, uh, Bob and Marla have experienced as a surprise on Friday morning are difficult, but we also give you thanks with them that they are offset by the safety that Bob and Marla and their, their house and the mother dog experienced even the loss of the barn and pups. We give you thanks for the safety that Renee and her neighbors in Anchorage felt as a result of strong building codes there. We thank you that even with massive earthquakes and many aftershocks throughout the whole week, people and property are relatively safe. We ask that you come down as your spirit of peace and bind them together as an Anchorage community. Support them in their anxieties as the aftershocks continue and they can no longer feel they trust the ground itself. We give you thanks also for the difficult challenges, uh, your presence in the midst of difficult challenges. We hear Anna excited about a new stage of life, responding to a sense of change in vocation, a call from you to be a caregiver as a nurse, but we also lift her up and her family, knowing that this transition from paying work to school brings with it many challenges in childcare and in finances and family life. Strengthen them through the next years. Bring them calm and order and daily bread for their household. Bless her as she begins her schooling work. We thank you for the families in the neighborhood, in the community, in Marion, who have need to, to which we are responding. Help us to see them as beloved neighbors and not just objects of our pity or our generosity. Help us to care for them as people and extend our love beyond this season. We thank you for the work that Dennis reported in Martin, the sacred shawl shelter that MDS helped continue working on. We thank you that there are people in the church and in this world who care enough about what Jesus said to care for the homeless and the hungry and the cold, that they're willing to put their money and their time on the line to build places of warmth and shelter. Thank you for MDS's work and Dennis's example, traveling here and there to serve in places of need. We ask now that, we, that your presence would be with us in our worship time, that you would strengthen us just as you strengthen Billy in his life, to be people of strong faith, of exemplary character, living out life and vocation to the fullest, that we may minister to everyone who meets us. We call you to come and be among us, and yet we know that somehow, mysteriously, you already are. And for that, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. As we transition in the service from the weight of bringing our prayer concerns in the faces of tragedy and hardship, to turn to the Gospels and to hear the rough words of John the Baptist, 
feels a little out of, may feel a little out of place. It may feel like we're not in tune with the spirit of this service. But I invite you to hear past the, the, un, uh, the sharp language that John uses and listen for the ways in which he too is calling on God, calling on us to make things right. Calling on God to heal the hurt and the harm in the world. And so as Lee comes forward to transition our focus to uh, Luke 3, much of which is found in your bulletin, I invite you in your awareness that the John is hard to hear to listen for the words of hope that God is speaking through John the Baptist. Lee, would you come and read Luke 3? Brad Anderson has been teaching our Sunday school class how to read scripture as a narrative. This style of reading looks at the story that's being told in a scripture passage, um, how it's structured, and what we can learn from the way the story is told. We examine things like structure, setting, point of view, characterization, and plot. This can often give new insights into reading old and familiar passages. I'd like to use a few of these concepts in, in uh, presenting today's scripture. Turn to the, the scripture in your bulletin and let's take a look. In this passage, Luke is the narrator. Ever the historian, Luke begins by setting his characters in the larger context of the Roman world. Pastor Nick left out verse 1 in the bulletin, but I'll read it because it does set the historical context. Here Luke goes all out and lists seven leaders, both secular and religious. The setting begins in the desert or wilderness. The desert is often a setting for prophecy. Indeed, Luke quotes prophecy from Isaiah about crooked roads being made straight and, and uh, rough ways smooth. He may also be hinting that the main character himself is a prophet. The main character is John the Baptist. Luke makes an interesting contrast with all the powerful leaders he mentions in verse 1 and John, a lone man out in the desert. This maybe suggests the powerful forces that will be lining up against John later in the story. The setting changes as John begins traveling around the Jordan River preaching. The secondary characters are the crowds that are coming out to hear John preach and be baptized. The plot in this account has something to do with John's interactions with the crowds. Something about John draws them in. There uh, yet appears to be some conflict in this narrative as John is calling the people a brood of vipers. His message is not a cozy one. And yet the crowds keep coming. Repentance is the main theme. The final character in this story is God who came to speak to John. What John is saying and doing flows out of his conversation with God. As we read this, we ask ourselves the question, what does this narrative tell us about God? Luke 3, 1 to 9. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, 
You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce a fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. In response to this, to this scripture reading, let's sing uh, from the blue uh, hymnal number 183 on Jordan's banks, the Baptist cry. And you may remain seated. As a parent, I'm living in a world in which I'm very aware of the many ways in which you can tell things with a slant. Many ways in which we as humans are capable of telling what we sometimes in the most direct ways call a lie. As a parent of children who sometimes mistreat one another or mistreat the things in their house or forget to do things they're supposed to do, I've learned because of the tendency and the easiness with which it is for us as humans to tell an untruth, that I have to ask my question very carefully so I don't set my children up to tell me one. Instead of saying, did you wash your hands? To which they're tempted to, of course, say, yes. I've had to couch my language and, and ask in a way that doesn't lead them on, lead them into temptation. So I lead them not by saying, what did you wash your hands with? I've just recently started doing that, and then they look at me and go, that's not what I expected. I didn't. One of the things that I'm anticipating, yearning for God to set right, is our relationship to telling the truth. It's so much work to try and coax out of my kids the, 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 the courage to say it like it is to let them release the fears of what's going to happen if they did something wrong or they perceive they did something wrong and want to tell a lie. And Advent this year, we're focused on God coming and giving us God's righteousness. What that means, God's righteousness is simply, an is simply the way in which God, by God's actions and very character and ways of being in the world, set things right, correct that which is wrong, 
do away with the harm that has been created. Lee mentioned when, we, when he hears God's righteousness, some of the, the baggage, the associations that come with that language is one of judgment, which is true. One of a, 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 a frightening God, a God that doles out punishment in judgment. God's righteousness, God's holiness, God is a fire. These things feel intimidating and scary. We often talk about righteousness of humans and righteousness of God being shown through ethics and morals and moral living. And it is some of these things, but, but that's to view righteousness as too cold of a thing, of, of an idea, of an ideal. But when God is righteous, when God is setting things right, it's not so much an idea, a concept, a theology, a doctrine, a moral that God is setting right. But it is something in a relationship. There's something in, in between you and I, between God and myself, between myself and creation, the rest of creation, between myself and myself. When God is showing God's righteousness, it's not a cold, removed, ideal concept about how I should act, but it's, it's God setting that which is wrong and askew in my relationship with the world and with God, setting it back the right way, realigning it correctly. I am painfully aware that there's a lot in the world and in my relationships that needs to be set right, that's not yet righteous. There's things beyond us, beyond our control. A tragic skiing accident for a young and promising man of faith connected to our congregation. That is an aspect of the world that we yearn for God to set right. And God, if God is righteous and good, then why? Then please, God, set those kind of tragedies aright. Heal, Billy. Stop such things from happening again. We yearn, we wait in Advent for that to be fully fulfilled. I know as I listen to the news and read uh, journalism, not media, but um, actual newspapers, that there are clear indications of corruption by the most powerful individuals in business and in politics in our world. The powerful using and misusing their power for the disadvantage of the rest of us and the poor and the disadvantaged. I read climate reports from varieties of scientists around the world and they are alarmed, they are, they are frightened that our natural world will be fine in your lifetime and probably in mine. But within my ch children's lifetime, it will be extremely difficult to have safe and secure human life. All these things cause me to go in Advent, Dear Lord, as last week's text said, rend the heavens and get down here and set things right because they're very askew. I'm also aware that there are things in me, my own tendency, like my children, to tell things slant, to tell things untrue. I know that I don't live out God's ways rightly or speak God's ways rightly or relate to you and God and others rightly. I know my society doesn't. So I can understand the yearning that the Is Israelite people, the people of God, had in their waiting. They suffered millennia, at least several hundred years of waiting for God to set their hopeless, tragic situations right. They waited for a righteous Savior, which we now know came in the baby and then the person of Jesus. The language from the prophets, and you'll see in the actual literal imagery, imagery of our candles, is that of the dead stump of our lives. Our churches, the people of God, are cut off and rotting. And our hope is that God will bring new life, new stems of green, out of our dead stumps. Normally in the Advent season, we think of the, the nostalgic things, the, the crisp nativity scene, the lights and the greenery, the things that make us feel warm and happy even though the nativity scene is of a child freezing in a manure-caked barn in a feed bunker. We miss the irony and the tragedy of that situation. The church doesn't give us the opportunity to ignore the hard cries for God to set things right. The church tradition gives us the scriptures we focus on in this season. We call it the lectionary, and, and different churches use it differently. But today's lectionary gave us John the Baptist of all people, not a warm and fuzzy Christmas character. But it is, after all, not the Christmas season yet. 
It's the Advent season, the, ad the season of waiting until Christ's Mass on the 25th. We're supposed to be still preparing and waiting. And so the scripture this morning from the wider church, from the church of tradition, suggests uh, that it's inappropriate not to hear the angels, Gloria and Excelsis Deo, but to hear the gruff and grumbly John the Baptist, who is out in the wilderness with his honey and locusts and camel skin and sees the people and, you brood of vipers, what are you doing here? It's a cranky pastor if I've ever heard one. But John is a necessary character for us right now because he calls out what we need to hear most. Prepare the way for God who is coming. Look at the crookedness of the world and of your lives, and God wants to make it straight. The uneven places in society and in your lives, God wants to, to level them out, to bring down the mountains and raise up the lowly, the plains, the valleys. This year I've been hearing that language of, of God setting things right in different ways through John the Baptist. I was cued in on his language of make straight the crooked ways. I've been thinking about this concept of straight and crooked long before the events of, and the indictments and the politics of this week. So I'm not doing this in reaction to the things that have come to light in, through, through indictments this week. But I've been thinking very much about John's call to being straight and true, to God making things instead of misinformed and crooked, lie-telling and untruthful, but straight and true. There's a lot of words, a lot of language going around right now in which we're not sure what is straight or true. The last three years have thrown into question, made us despair that we can ever really know what's actually out there. And it doesn't actually matter what side of the political or social spectrums you're on. I hear it from all corners. People going, oh, I'm not sure I even know what's actually reality anymore. The dominant question in just 18 short months, or maybe three years, is this despair that we can actually know what's happening for real in the world. Maybe it's crooked, but we don't know what's actually straight and true. This has been coined already the post-facts world. The fake news era, the alternative facts, that whatever you think is right, whatever news uh, media, maybe not journalism that you're, you're pursuing and watching and imbibing, that slants what you know about the world and what's real. It biases misinformation and disinformation and fraudulent information and falsehood and li outright lies, fake news and post-facts and alternative facts. These are rife in our world right now at least conversations about it. And we feel it despairing that things will ever, the crooked ways will ever be set straight. Fact checkers despair that no matter how quickly you fact check a fake news story or a misleading tweet, the truth is never as viral as the sensational misinformation. Thankfully, just because something trending doesn't make it true, and just because it's on the internet, by the way, definitely doesn't make it true. In fact, it's reason for skepticism. And I feel your despair. I feel the despair too. But the difficulty discerning what is real and what is not real is not a new thing. Genesis tells us it's, it's one of the key early struggles, the first struggles that humans had when Eve and Adam aren't sure if what the snake is saying is real. The serpent. Eve and Adam fall at the very beginning to the hoax. So falling to fake news has been uh, millennia long. It has been the, the history of humans. Even in Jesus' own day, we get this encounter with uh, Pilate in John 18. And I don't know if I actually even have it. Oh, here it is. John 18, 37 to 38. John, uh, Pilate himself, who is a very learned man, is putting Jesus on trial. He wants to know the facts. He's putting him before the court. And Pilate says... After all that questioning, it appears you are a king. This is John 18, 37 and 38. And Jesus answers his assertion, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born was to come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone on the side of truth listens to me, to Jesus. To which Pilate retorts the question we all have been voicing. What is true? What is true? And then ironically, Pilate says, I find no basis for a charge against him. This question of 
can we possibly know what's real in this swirling disinformation is not a new one. I don't know if that gives you hope or just more despair at human situation, but at least want you to know that you're in good company with many millennia of people. This is not the end of the world as, as we know it, but it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. So this Advent, we long for, for God to come in as God has never done before in new ways to, to correct, to make true and right that which is crooked and slanted. I'm going to say this just once, and I'll try and leave it behind for the rest of the year. Thankfully, it's almost the end of the year. Um, I don't want to say too much about federal political things from this pulpit, because that's not generally what the church needs to be focused on. But unfortunately, the church has been focused on blue and red politics. And so, so this once, I will say this. In light of John's call for the crooked rays to be set straight, and I know this is going to, man, this is going to tick a handful of you off, but I want to model telling it straight that there is no denying that our current leader, our current president, does not act or communicate in truthful or righteous and straight ways. I hope we can at least agree upon that. And I know a bunch of you in your heads are already arguing with me, fake news, fake news, bias. And, and I do have a bias, and I try to, to work it out by the Holy Spirit. But I plead with you, if you're still listening to me, let's see if you're checked out, if you have any respect for me left as your leader, please accept, even if you love the man, and, and, and I love the man, even if you admire the man, POTUS number 45, it, it is almost indisputable that he averages 10 false or misleading claims, almost 10, every day. 6,500 right before the midterms, less than two years. And by the way, I wrote this sermon, uh, this sermon was in the works months ago, so I'm not bringing this to you this week as a reaction to the indictments. That just happens to be sadly timely. I put that divisive statement on the table so that you can understand why I'm so distraught this season. You'll read it in my annual report. I, I don't know, as, as a pastor, I'm, I'm charged with speaking the truth. But I also see the church defending untruths, misleading information, division. And that can't be. John the Baptist gruffly and angrily says, make straight the crooked paths. And there's so much that is crooked and untruthful in the air right now. In myself, the, the places I listen, and, and the places that many of you listen, we listen. So I, I say this divisive political statement knowing that I'll probably lose some of your credibility over the next few years because of that. But, but I have to say it because we can't be as a church defending political or social idea lies. I grew up in the 90s in which my family, myself, my church, Lower Deer Creek, uh, were very clear. We had no problem publicly calling out the unrighteousness and uh, lies of Slick Willie. Anybody around here know who Slick Willie was? Which guy is that? Oh, maybe it's not a term. Maybe that's just a Rush Limbaugh term. Sorry, I was a ditto head too. If that endears you to me. Uh, Slick Willie is Bill Clinton. And I grew up in a church in which it was, it was regular and, and easy for us to call that out. And, and, and also to call out Hillary and their, you know, their, their richness and their privilege in the years since then and even very recently. But then I was bothered by the fact that those same folks, my own family and myself, uh, when other political leaders outside of our par inside of our favored parties did similar things, like now, we ended up defending and even lifting up the behavior, not as unrighteous and untrue, but as eh, maybe God-led, Cyrus-like, Cyrus-like. And I want to warn you, this hypocrisy, this, this, this inconsistency is seen by my generation and probably some others as we flee the church for this and other reasons. The church has no business whatsoever defending human leaders when they mislead and when they live unstraight and crooked ways. The church is in the business of truth-telling, not worldly partisan slant or defending it. And it's ironic, actually. I think part of the reason we, we really, had, many of us found Trump refreshing early on was that it seemed like his, his unvarnished style of speaking felt like sh shooting it straight, straight from the hip or whatever. Um, telling it not slant, but just telling it direct. In a world in which we had gotten tired of the work uh, uh, and the, the 
the, the world of the last decade, we've had to be ever more careful about how we say things because there's lots of sensitivity. We have to be politically correct and, and careful and inclusive, and that gets tiring. And we watch the political speak and the political correctness, and we wonder, what are those church leaders and those political leaders and those media leaders, what are they really saying under their nicely couched phrases? We got tired of wondering what was hidden under the, the careful language, what intents and meanings. And so we found it refreshing, I think. We felt like it was truth-telling when people, when candidates, tell it like they saw it. That looked like John the Baptist, brash and bold and clear. Prepare the way, make straight paths from the crooked. Drain, I won't say it. So we swooned when instead of John the Baptist as a brash prophet, we got a brash billionaire. And, and, and it was wonderful because I didn't feel like anything was being hidden. No political correctness, not hiding deep or complicated meanings. But the reality is that telling it plain like we see it sometimes is just our own bias. It doesn't mean we're actually telling the truth. We humans, one of the things we know, and I know about myself, I know about my children, I know about you, I know about leaders, is that we are, it's very easy for us to be self-deceived. To think we're telling it with the best intentions and the correctness, and in the end we're actually telling it crooked and slant, because we're so easily mispersuaded, biased from our experiences. So in all this season full of false and misleading claims, and the church, what, what really is troubling is not the leaders, because I expect the leaders to do that. I think power and money and uh, prestige corrupt and, and drive you to those things. Just like when I ask my children the wrong question, they're tempted to lie. I think those things, maybe I'm, I'm jaded, are, are probably what's to be expected of people in power. What bothers me is that we the church, we the members of Christ's body, are defending what, that which is crooked rather than holding up that which is straight. And so this morning, even though John the Baptist feels to me like he's speaking, at first it feels to me like, oh, he's speaking to political leaders, then I noticed what I left out of the bulletin, which Lee helpfully brought up. These people of power. You don't have it with you in the bulletin, so maybe turn in your Bibles, your actual Bibles, to it. Um, oh, where in my notes is that? What happens when you print the scripture instead of... Um, I want to read... Ah, oh, here it is. The people who are in view when John the Baptist start preaching. John, Luke 3 starts with this verse. He sets the stage in a very grand way. There's a ton of powerful, the most powerful people there. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ooh, nepotism, uh, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, and in the religious sphere, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, during all the powerful reign of those people, bracket commentary, the word of God came to, da -da -da -da, John. Wait, what? Tiberius, Caesar, Pontius Pilate, Herod, Philip, Lysanias, the high priests, and the word of God came to, wait, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Don't miss the point of contrast here. Luke 3, 1 lists the most powerful and probably in many respects the most crooked people in John's day. With the biggest armies and the biggest coffers and the most influence. And those leaders are the ones by our logic, including the highly respected religious ones, the pastor, who we think would receive God's straightening word. Because they, especially the leaders, I mean, Tiberius Caesar needs God's road straightening word. But God's right making, truth telling word doesn't show up in Rome or Jerusalem or the temple, but it's way out on the margins in a back country, in the wilderness with a dis disowned, annoying prophet. Someone at the margins. In the wilderness to John, son of Zechariah, a disgraced. Uh, maybe disgraced, uh, a priest who was made silent to a nobody and a nowhere. So here I am in this age wanting, wanting the courts and God's truth-telling, the church to stand up and point the finger to on high in Jerusalem, in D.C. or in Pierre or in Sioux Falls. And if I'm paying attention, Luke 3 names those people and then points the finger down to the rest of us. It's not that the leaders, 
The powerful don't have a responsibility. The Old Testament prophets make it clear. You leaders need to care for the sojourner and the poor and the widow and the orphan and all who are disadvantaged. It's clear from the Old Testament throughout that leaders have a responsibility to tell it and live it straight. But there's also probably an awareness that that they're probably the least likely to make the change. And so John the Baptist and God turns to the wilderness and to the people flocking to the margins and speaks it to them. You all turn yourselves around. You all make straight in your lives that which needs to be straight. This is true populism. Not turning to a billionaire leader, but taking stock of our own lives and our own communities and our own churches and going, okay, we are irritated, we are irked, we are ticked at what's going on above us. But let's not let that be an excuse to pay attention to what's crooked among us and in me. John the Baptist, again, is crude. You brood of vipers, why'd you come to hear me preach? Who told you how to get out of your miry muck? Okay, if you're here, turn around, repent. Bear fruit that is in accordance with God's righteousness. That way you don't get cut down and left as a dead stump. And then John goes on to speak not truth to power, but truth to the rest of us who are actually there to listen. The people who showed up were the ones willing to heed. And so the, I, we didn't print it, but John goes on. So if you haven't turned there, go ahead and turn to Luke 3. John the Baptist gives this call that's in your bulletin, and the crowds respond because they're, they're receptive. They want to hear this. They're not going to tweet objections. Okay, what should we do then, verse 10 asks. The crowd asks, what should we do? And John answers to their particular needs and context, because each of them is crooked in a different way. Any one of you who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. Any one of you who has extra food, or food at all, should share with the one, should do the same. And even to those who were even lower on the margins, the tax collectors in verse 12, they also came to be baptized. They were corrupt, but receptive. Those tax collectors said, what should we do? And John tells them, don't collect any more than that what is required of you. And then some soldiers, the collaborators, the co-conspirators, ask him, what should we do? And John replies, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. And be content with your pay. The individuals, the low people among us, the, the disregarded and looked down upon in our community, God has a word for them. A word that at first seems like scary righteousness, judgment, accusation. But in the end, is a word of hope and healing. Where those who are, are criminals, those who are broken, those who are sinful can come to God and say, what should we do? I'm willing to try. And God's word of truth can say to them, in your situation, you've got more than enough. Share your shirts and your food. Stop complaining about what you not having enough pay. Don't accuse people falsely and gossip and whatever else. God has a specific truth, a straightening for each of our lives. I'm not sure what yours is. Sometimes we don't even know what ours are. And so we need prophets to tell us. What am I supposed to straighten? We need pastors and spouses who are attuned and, and Sunday school leaders and, and peers, fellows, who come along beside us and say, hey, I'm wondering if you maybe need to let go of this or straighten out this or can I help you with this? The people, John, Luke, uh, Luke 3 ends, the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if this John might possibly be the Messiah. And John answered them all, I baptize you simply with plain old water, but the one who is coming is even more powerful than I. The straps of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie, he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff in the unquenchable fire. And in many such words, other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news, the good news that God straightened them out if they were willing to them. God has a, a, a word in this Advent season preparing you, your lives, our congregation, to be straightened out that which is crooked, that which is untrue and false and fake news here among us. And it'll be healing, and it'll be relieving to get it off our chests. 
And it also might kill us, <laughs> literally. John the Baptist goes the next two, chat, two verses. He finally gets a chance to speak truth to power because he's also responsible for that. And he tells it to Herod like he sees it. And what does Herod do to him? Anybody got the Bible open or know the story? Yeah, cuts off his head. Don't talk to me like that. We have a responsibility to receive God's truth, knowing that it could put us as martyrs in God's kingdom. <laughs> so this Advent season, we're waiting for God to set the world right. <laughs> I'm waiting for God to set you all right, other people right. But if I'm humble and correct, I'm really especially waiting for God to set me right. My family, my sphere of influence. I need to hear from people at the margins of the world. The John the Baptist are spitting in my face. You brood of vipers. You, you viper in the viper pit. Who warned you? You better produce fruit in keeping in line with God's life turnaround in Jesus. And if you don't, there'll be a new pastor. A new family leader. New trees in God's orchard. New children adopted for Abraham. So as we get ready, as I prepare myself for Christmas, I admit I'm crooked, I'm unfaithful, I'm untrue, and I'm not right. Neither are any of us. In order to get ready for Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the full life, we can't get there on our own to God's righteousness. And so God sends Jesus as the righteous stump, bringing new life from our dead ones. And that's the thing we wait for in Advent. Not a cute little baby, but the judging Savior King who is going to set all things right and well. May it come quickly. May it be so. Amen.
You'll notice in your bulletin at this point in the service we have an opportunity to watch part of the Christmas story, but we've actually decided to forego the original uh, scene that was from, uh, from the, the classic dovetail play from Ted Schwartz, uh, Ted and Company, partly because the theatrical humor in it was not uh, as fitting as it could be, uh, quite as appropriate for, for our, the, the weight that we carry with us this morning. Um, humor is an appropriate thing in worship and it can be healing, but this particular story didn't necessarily fit with what we were walking with this morning. Though th we do have an alternative, uh, much shorter video. I think I, I hear the screens have come down. Uh, this one is not the, the theater piece, but it is simply a, a, a very short teaching video, about three and a half minutes, um, that gives us a little bit of perspective on the Advent word hope. Uh, the Christian word hope. And in, in, in light of, even though time is, is approaching, um, I want us to still hear this because uh, in light of the, the tragic loss we're facing, uh, looking at this week with Billy's life, um, I want us to be kind of aware of and hearing from God what hope, what, what true and healthy hope is like in the waiting seasons, whether it's in Advent or at the end of life. So this is from the, the Bible Project's Advent Word series, Hope is usually one of the candles we light. And so watch this uh, three-plus minute video on, on what hope is in this season. So let's say you want to describe the feeling of anticipating a future that's better than the present. You might be giddy or excited or maybe unsure, but most of us know that experience. We call it hope. It's a state of anticipation, and it's crucial for healthy human existence. And it's a really important concept in the Bible. In fact, there are many words for hope in the ancient languages of the Bible, and they're all fascinating. In the Old Testament, there are two main Hebrew words translated as hope. The first is yachal, which means simply to wait for. Like in the story of Noah and the ark, as the flood waters recede, Noah had to yachal for weeks. The other Hebrew word is kava, which also means to wait. It's related to the Hebrew word kav, which means cord. When you pull a kav tight, you produce a state of tension until there's release. That's kava, the feeling of tension and expectation while you wait for something to happen. The prophet Isaiah depicts God as a farmer who plants vines and kavas for good grapes. Or the prophet Micah talks about farmers who both kava and yachal for morning dew to give moisture to the land. So in Biblical Hebrew, hope is about waiting or expectation, but waiting for what? In the period of Israel's prophets, as the nation was sinking into self-destruction, Isaiah said, at this moment, the Lord's hiding his face from Israel, so I will kava for him. The only hope Isaiah had in those dark days was the hope for God himself. You find the same notion of hope all over the book of Psalms, where these words appear over 40 times. In almost every case, what people are waiting for is God. Like in Psalm 130, the poet cries out from a pit of despair, I kava for the Lord, let Israel yachal for the Lord, because he's loyal and will redeem Israel from its sins. Biblical hope is based on a person, which makes it different from optimism. Optimism is about choosing to see, in any situation, how circumstances could work out for the best. But biblical hope is not focused on circumstances. In fact, hopeful people in the Bible often recognize there's no evidence things will get better but you choose hope anyway. Like the prophet Hosea, he lived in a dark time when Israel was being oppressed by foreign empires, and he chose hope when he said God could turn this valley of trouble into a door of hope, like the day when Israel came up from the land of Egypt. God had surprised his people with redemption back in the days of the Exodus, and he could do so again. So it's God's past faithfulness that motivates hope for the future. You look forward by looking backward, trusting in nothing other than God's character. It's like the poet of Psalm 39 who says, And now, O Lord, what else can I kava for? You are my yachal. In the New Testament, the earliest followers of Jesus cultivated the similar habit of hope. They believed that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was God's surprising response to our slavery to evil and death. The empty tomb opened up a new door of hope, and they used the Greek word elpis to describe this anticipation. The Apostle Peter said that Jesus' resurrection opened up a living hope, that people can be reborn, to become new and different kinds of humans. 
More than once, the Apostle Paul says the good news about Jesus announces the El Peace of glory. In both cases, this El Peace is based on a person, the risen Jesus who has overcome death. And this hope wasn't just for humans. The Apostles believed that what happened to Jesus in the resurrection was a foretaste of what God had planned for the whole universe. In Paul's words, it's a hope that creation itself will be liberated from slavery to corruption into freedom when God's children are glorified. So Christian hope is bold, waiting for humanity and the whole universe to be rescued from evil and death. And some would say it's crazy, and maybe it is, but biblical hope isn't optimism based on the odds. It's a choice to wait for God to bring about a future that's as surprising as a crucified man rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Jesus in order to look forward. And so we wait. That's what the biblical words for hope are all about. So as Lee and the bell choir comes forward, I invite us to go from this place. Um, we are not optimistic that God will work a miracle at this late hour for Billy, for instance. We're not optimistic that he will continue to be with us in this world, but we do hold out hope in the person of Jesus that God is redeeming life out of even this tragic situation. So we go from here in true hope this Advent season. I invite Lee to come and the bell choir to take us into a, a time of giving. Our offering this morning is for Swan Lake Christian Camp, and we will also accept offerings from last Sunday, our Harvest Thank Offerings. Uh, if you have those with you, you can put them in the plates as well. Um, I'll invite the ushers to come up, and we'll have the offertory prayer. O oh God, for the blessings of this day and all our days, we give you thanks. We thank you for the ministry of Swan Lake Camp and the many lives it has touched, counseled, and mentored. Bless these gifts towards the ongoing work of the camp and bless the many and varied ministries supported with Harvest Thank Offerings. We pray this in your name. Amen.
Would you please rise with the bell choir? They ring, ode to joy and joy to the world, because indeed, God's voice is calling to you all, even in your darkest wilderness, preparing a place for Jesus to come, making straight the most crooked things in your lives. Whether you sit in a dark and deep valley or are elated on the mountaintop this season, God is making the crooked things straight in your lives and the rough places smooth. We anticipate the coming of Jesus in which all people will see God's salvation. Go in hope, in Jesus' name.